Okay, we're all set for our uh, second presentation in this workshop. And we're going to turn our, our thoughts to some devotional topics before we focus in on the subject of insulin resistance and diabetes and the metabolic syndrome. So let's ask the Lord to guide us as we uh, launch on this new chapter. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are the great physician. You're also the wonderful counselor. And we ask you to be with us this afternoon as we speak about this very pervasive, this very common condition throughout the Western world. Please be with us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, before we look at this topic, I want to remind you, both for yourselves and for those that you go back to try to inspire, that we actually have a divine mandate for this work. And one of the places I find the divine mandate for health ministry is in 1 Peter chapter 2. You may not have thought of this passage in this way, but Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, tells us that we're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. Well, Peter actually uses this uh, language more than once in this very chapter. Just a few verses earlier, he said, you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What Peter is saying here is that believers today are called as priests. We are called to be part of God's priesthood. Now, you may not have thought of this before, but every one of you, by being part of the priesthood of believers, is called with a priestly ministry. And in the Bible, the priesthood all contributed to revealing the character of Jesus. So we've been talking today in some of our discussions about how we are to represent Christ, how Jesus wants to live out through his life through us, and one of the ways that he does that is uh, through this priestly calling. I'd like to suggest to you that if you look at the priesthood in the Old Testament, you'll find that it included a number of things. It included spiritual ministry and preaching, but it also included teaching as well as healing and medical arts. If you think about it, the doctors in the Old Testament were who? They were the priests, right? If you had a skin condition, you didn't go to the dermatologist, you went to the priest. And in the New Testament, Jesus modeled priestly ministry. Twice in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus' ministry is summarized. First in Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, and then later in Matthew 9, 35, almost the very same words describing the ministry of Jesus. It's a threefold ministry. Jesus went about teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel, of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Why I'm showing you this as we go into looking at a very common medical condition, I want to remind you, and as you go back to your churches, as you go back to uh, uh, bodies of believers that you uh, might be working with, that we have a call to do this priestly ministry, and it includes teaching, preaching, and healing. If it's not clear with that kind of background, Recognize that every time Jesus had a commissioning service, every time he sent out disciples, he always called them to teach, to preach, and to heal. You find that with the commissioning of the 12. You find it when he sent out the 70. And you also find it when he gave the Great Commission. You don't find it in Matthew 28 explicitly, but in Mark 16, you see that Jesus called his followers to be involved in healing ministry as well as preaching and teaching. In fact, if this wasn't clear in the scriptures, the pen of inspiration made it clear. And this is speaking of that great commission. It says, in the trust given to the first disciples, who has a share? Each believer. That's right. Each believer. Every one of us. Each one is to be an executor of the Savior's will. We're to carry out Jesus wishes. A will is something that you write to take into effect when you leave or when you die. Jesus didn't die, but he left this earth. And so we're to be the executors of his will. He's given us this commission. Each one has been given a given sacred truth to give to the earnest seeker. Every believer is to be what? 
a laborer together with God. So it's a calling to every one of us, and this calling includes priestly ministry, which includes the teaching, preaching, and healing work of Jesus. Here's Councils on Health, page 425. We've come to a time when who should take hold of medical missionary work? Every member, Every member of the church. I'm glad that I've been meeting lay people here. I'm glad that I've been meeting pastors here. I'm glad that I do see health professionals here as well. But every one of us is called to work together in healing ministry. The world is a vast Lazar house filled with victims of both physical and spiritual disease. Everywhere people are perishing. By the way, where are you from? Some of you I've met from Germany, others from Austria, Italy, Slovenia, Sweden, Portugal, Portugal from all over. France, right? India. Where? India? Wonderful. Are there people perishing in those countries? They're perishing for a lack. It's true in the United States, too. Don't think that I'm dealing with anything different. It's everywhere. People are perishing for a lack of the knowledge of the truths that have been committed to us. So what is the great thing that they need? They need the truths that God has committed to us. So we're all called to share these great messages. And what's our problem? Some of us are asleep. The members of the church are in need of an awakening, in need of an awakening, that they may realize their responsibility to impart these truths. So hopefully as we're here, we're not just hearing interesting lectures, that as we come to these meetings, you're saying, what is God giving me? What has he given me that he wants me to go back and share? And we, we should leave here more enthusiastic about sharing the Adventist health message. Amen. Those who have been enlightened by the truth are to be light bearers to the world. To hide our light at this time is to make a terrible mistake. So if you think, well, I, you know, this doesn't seem popular where I am, if you're hiding your light, thinking this is wisdom, you're making a terrible mistake. The call for God's people is arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Well, with that background, with this calling that we have, I want to suggest to you that one of the great entering wedges we have today is dealing with insulin resistance. That throughout the Western world, the countries that you represent, even India, wherever you're from, the whole world, this is an epidemic of a condition that's related, conditions, plural, that are related to insulin resistance. In this seminar, we've especially uh, been tasked to look at diabetes, heart disease, and uh, uh, related topics like high blood pressure and abnormal cholesterol levels. We're going to find, though, that insulin resistance takes us a step further and even addresses some of the root causes of cancer, certain types of cancer, as well as infertility. So it's an extremely important topic. I find in America that many people are unaware of the ravages of insulin resistance. This was a study, however, that got the medical community's attention in America about a decade ago. The metabolic syndrome is the manifestations of insulin resistance. It's what happens when your tissues are not responding to insulin the way they should. And what this is showing is just how pervasive, how many people are affected in America with this condition. And I can't tell you that I've researched all your other countries, but uh, this is an epidemic. It's a global epidemic. In America, it's affecting about 25% of our population, regardless of race or gender, roughly about 25% with the metabolic syndrome. Well, you say that's interesting, but it gets even more interesting when you realize that as we get older, our likelihood of having this condition increases. So I've noticed something at this conference, that there are some of you here today that are actually getting older. How many of you are impressed with my clinical judgment? <laughs> That's right, we're all getting older. And as we get older, we're more likely to experience insulin resistance, this condition where insulin is not working the way it should. In America, when we get into our 60s and 70s, nearly half the population have this condition. So we're looking at a very important condition throughout the world, actually, and we're going to all find out today if we have it. Would you like to know whether you have the metabolic syndrome or not? Hopefully you know some of your blood values, but we're going to take a quiz right now, a five-question quiz. And uh, by the way, how many of you are still in school? Now, those of you in school, how many of you like to get high grades on your quizzes and tests? 
Well, don't let that carry over into this quiz. You want to get a low grade. The lower, lower is better. So here's the five questions. Here's the first one. Do you have abdominal obesity? Are you bigger around the middle than 102 centimeters if you're a man or 88 centimeters if you're a woman? Now, some people get confused about this measurement. It's not the size of your belt. I have some patients who have a belt and they say, Dr. DeRose, I wore this belt when I was in high school. But then over the belt, there's a large amount that's hanging. <laughs> They're overweight and they have a large abdominal obesity. It's the largest measurement around the middle, usually at the level of the navel or the belly button. Triglycerides. If you haven't had your triglycerides measured, it would be a good thing to know. These are most accurate if they're measured after 12 hours of fasting. If you're tr these are now, some of you uh, will convert those into SI units for me. Uh, I didn't uh, uh, have that foresight. But uh, triglycerides above 150. HDL, the good cholesterol less than 40 for a man, less than 50 for a woman. So we've gone through three questions. If you have all these problems, if you have abdominal obesity, high triglycerides, and low HDL, you already have the metabolic syndrome because it's three out of five or more that show this condition. Then we have blood pressure here, greater than 130, greater than or equal to for the systolic, greater than or equal to 85 for the diastolic, and then a fasting blood sugar of 100. Anyone can help me with the SI units for these? Do you, any of you know the international units? Dia what is the cutoff for diabetes in SI? Is it around 6? 5 what? 5.5. So 5.5, is that right? 5.5 is going to be uh, probably around 125. So I'm guessing this may be 4.5. I think you can divide it, uh, no, I shouldn't hazard a guess. I think you divide it by 18, but uh, does that sound right? Yeah. 100 is 5.5, 5.45. Okay, so 100 is 5.5. So that would be the cutoff, you, you were translating it for us there. That's not the cutoff for diabetes, that's the cutoff then for pre-diabetes or metabolic syndrome, 5.5, thank you. Okay, so we've talked about some of these points. Let's talk a little bit more about insulin resistance. So some of you, hopefully, if you saw you have three of those out of five or more, you're more interested in the topic, but I can tell you, going back to churches and to communities where people have this problem, insulin is the hormone that the pancreas makes that allows us to move blood sugar from our bloodstream to our tissues. So you can't move sugar out of your bloodstream unless insulin is present. We all need it to live. If you have no insulin in your blood, what happens to you? You actually die. That's correct. So we have a life or death need for insulin. Well, with that in mind, let's consider this. Because we all need insulin, we look at something called insulin sensitivity as a measure for how well that insulin is working. So for example, if your body is responding very well to insulin, you just need a little bit of insulin to get the job done, we say you're very insulin sensitive, or similarly, we could say you have very little insulin resistance. Do you see how that works? They're just flip sides of the same thing. So let me express it this way. Let's see if you can help me if I ask you a question. If I have high insulin resistance, where would my insulin sensitivity be? If the insulin resistance is high, where is insulin sensitivity? It's low. Do you see how that works? If insulin sensitivity is high, then insulin resistance is low. So you can see it reported both ways in the research literature. But the important thing to understand is that this is a measure of how well insulin is working in the body. And so we're looking at these concepts, and the metabolic syndrome occurs when insulin is not working the way it should in your body. The first thing we often see 
is some of these different markers of insulin resistance. So what happens over time? Over time, if you have insulin resistance, if your sensitivity to insulin is not good, if the tissues aren't responding properly, the body addresses that by producing more insulin to get the job done. And sometimes I use an analogy. Uh, let's say we have a door here. I can't move around like I like to do in my lectures because I'm tied to these microphones. But uh, let's say we have a door here. Insulin is like, some people like the analogy of a key that opens the door. I like to say insulin is the doorman that opens the door. So the tissues have these doors and the insulin opens the door so the blood sugar can go into the cells. Well, what does insulin re resistance represent? It represents a door that's sticky. The hinges don't work. It's an old door. And so the doorman can't open it. The door is too stiff. But if he gets some help from his friends, if he has two or three men, they can open that door. And that's what happens with insulin resistance. You have, the body has to send more manpower, more insulin, to get the job done. The problem with this is over time, because insulin resistance is driven by many lifestyle factors, the insulin receptors tend to get more insensitive. The pancreas has to produce more and more insulin. And then if you're genetically predisposed, the pancreas will fail. It will fatigue, and you will develop diabetes. If you like graphs with uh, illustrations rather than words, this is an illustration that shows you what's happening. As insulin resistance increases, the body tries to keep up with it by increasing insulin production. But finally, you get to the point where the body can't keep up with it if you're genetically predisposed. And then your blood fasting blood sugar and your blood sugar two hours after meals also rises and you have diabetes. Just to make sure we're all speaking the same language, one of the things we're going to find that increases insulin resistance is obesity. Would any of you like to guess what the heaviest person that we've seen at Weimar over the last uh, four years is? How much do you think that person weighed in kilograms? I'm having to calculate that here. But how many kilograms do you think our heaviest patient weighed? 400? Why? 200. 200 would be very big. Well, he weighed over 300 kilograms, not 400. It's about 303 kilograms. Now, because obesity increases insulin resistance, do you think it likely or unlikely that he had diabetes? It was likely, but he did not have diabetes. His blood sugar was totally normal. So what do we know about this person? We know that he had a very good pancreas because he had lots of insulin resistance and he, his blood sugar was normal. The average person, they'll get diabetes from obesity alone long before they weigh 300 kilograms. Do you see? So some, that's why I say genetically predisposed. Some people can be on a very bad lifestyle and they got a good pancreas in their genes. We were talking about these genetics earlier. Other people got a, a weak pancreas. And so they just, they might be on a better lifestyle than most people, but they're maybe not perfect on their exercise. Maybe they're not just eating the perfect diet for them. And maybe even the perfect diet isn't enough if they've got bad enough genetics. You see what I'm saying? So this is one of the reasons we can't judge other people. It's because we're all different genetically, do you see? But it's not just the genetics, it's the lifestyle as well, and that's where we need to go. Let's just see if we're understanding things together. Here's the first question. Could I have the metabolic syndrome? It's sometimes called syndrome X and not have diabetes. So I don't have diabetes, could I have this metabolic syndrome? What do you think? How many of you say yes? Raise your hands. How many of you say no? Well, you're a good group. Those of you that weren't sure were careful not to raise your hands when I asked the incorrect response. So it's true. 
We can have the metabolic syndrome even if our blood sugar is normal. We could have high blood pressure. We could have obesity. We could have other things going on that all are markers or indicators of the metabolic syndrome or syndrome X. Well, let's look at the next point here, and that's why should I care? Why should I even care if I have the metabolic syndrome? What I'm trying to help you see here is this is an opportunity to educate people. When I give a lecture in the community about diabetes, I don't start by speaking about diabetes. I start by speaking about the metabolic syndrome. Because the metabolic syndrome, or insulin resistance, is the root cause of diabetes. And many more people have this condition than have diabetes. So if I'm lecturing on diabetes, and a family member comes, I want them to be aware that they're at risk for this problem as well. So here's why you should be concerned about whether or not you have insulin resistance or the metabolic syndrome. One of them could be that you're having trouble sleeping. And you were having trouble sleeping last night. Is that possible that someone didn't sleep well last night? It's possible that you couldn't sleep well because you were wondering if you had an elevated von Willebrand factor antigen. Isn't that possible? Well, it's more likely you're going to lay awake tonight worried about that than last night, right? Because most people aren't concerned about this. These may seem, and I show this to lay people, this slide. Most people haven't heard about these risk factors for heart disease and stroke. But these are known heart disease risk factors. They're things that make the blood more likely to clot. This is from one of the mo most long-running epidemiologic studies in the world. It's called the Framingham study. They've been looking at heart disease risk factors in Massachusetts, a Massachusetts community that's a state in the United States on the East Coast near, near the town of Boston. And what they found is if your insulin levels are higher, why would someone have higher insulin levels? Why would they have more, more insulin in their blood? Because they have more insulin resistance, that's right. So what we're looking at is an indication of insulin resistance in the metabolic syndrome. If you have higher insulin levels in the blood, it raises all of these other compounds that put you at greater risk of a stroke or a heart attack. So even if you never develop diabetes, if insulin is not working in your body the way it should, it's increasing your risk of a serious cardiovascular event. Well, with that background, some of the common risk factors that we talk about are also affected by insulin resistance and elevated insulin levels. So as your blood insulin levels go up, look what happens to your good cholesterol. The good cholesterol, the HDL, goes down, and the triglycerides, which are detrimental or undesirable for heart disease, they rise. So what you see here is these conventional risk factors. Even the LDL, the so-called bad cholesterol, becomes more damaging to the artery if you have insulin resistance. So the message is every one of us should be concerned about whether or not we have insulin resistance. So here's the next question. Some of you might say, well, if I gave this quiz in my community, we're a fit community. I come from uh, Portugal, and the people there are much healthier than the United States. Or I'm from France, and we uh, follow a better lifestyle, or Germany, wherever you're from. And uh, most of my uh, community members, church members, they may only have one or two of those indicators. Remember, here's this uh, list of indicators. And you say, no, not many people are overweight. They usually have good blood pressure, but some of them have high blood sugar. Maybe some have high triglycerides. Are they safe if they just have one or two of these things? It's very interesting. Even a single one of these factors increases your risk of both heart disease and diabetes, even a single one of those metabolic indicators. Let's just look briefly at some of the research. This is here from uh, Europe. And you find uh, in this particular study, as they followed these uh, individuals, these men, for some five years, they found the more of the metabolic syndrome points they got, more of those five points, the greater their risk of coronary heart disease. So it'd be like a heart attack. And you can see here, this is the reference group. They got a zero on those five questions. They didn't have any of those. But as those increased, what happens? 
a stepwise increase in their likelihood of having heart disease. So is the metabolic syndrome important when we're talking about heart disease? Most definitely. Is it relevant to high blood pressure and diabetes? Yes. Do you see why we're looking at this? Because it ties in all of these conditions, and we're going to see how it ties in then with the Adventist lifestyle message. So as we go on, it's very similar also when it comes to diabetes, only even more remarkable. You can see here those with none of those questions in the affirmative, they had a risk of one. They're the reference group. If you just had one of those metabolic factors, just one out of the five, you over double your risk of developing diabetes, two, a quadrupling of the risk, and you can see as you have four or five, you have over 20 times the risk of developing diabetes in the research. So we need to be concerned about these metabolic syndrome components. They're dangerous even before our blood sugar levels begin to rise. Now, in America, we speak a lot about a new diagnosis called prediabetes. Do you talk about that in Europe, prediabetes? Yes. Some of you say yes, some of you say no. Uh, prediabetes is the term that we now use in place of impaired fasting glucose. Have you heard of that? Is that a common term? And then also what we have after meals. What do you call that here in Europe? Impaired glucose tolerance is what we call it in America. So impaired glucose tolerance, that's the postprandial or post-meal blood sugars. If they're elevated or if your fasting sugars are elevated, those terms were too difficult for the lay public in America. They couldn't remember them. And so we call it pre-diabetes now. And it's not just for that reason. It's we know that these uh, pre-diabetes uh, numbers, the impaired glucose tolerance and impaired fasting glucose, are indeed warnings of uh, the likelihood of developing full-blown diabetes in the not-too-distant future. So from that perspective, what I'd like you to see is pre-diabetes in the United States takes in a huge proportion of our adult population. It's about 40% of the U.S. population that has this condition. And uh, you could individualize this data for your uh, individual community or your country or your region. And I know uh, some of that data is available. So here's the important messages uh, about prediabetes. If you have prediabetes, so that's a blood sugar in um, the range of 5.5 and what, 6.5, about that range, 5.5 to 6.5. You don't yet have diabetes. Is that true? You won't call someone with a blood sugar of six diabetic? When do you make the diagnosis? Fasting blood sugar? It's seven? OK. So this would be a blood sugar between 5.5 and seven. So we're not going to say they have diabetes yet, but it's higher than optimal. So 5.5 to seven in the SI units, that's prediabetes. The research indicates that every year, over 10% of those people will cross into full-blown diabetes. Within 10 years, the majority of those people will have full-blown diabetes. And the point that we've already been making is even if you don't have diabetes, you're already damaging your heart and your blood vessels. So this is extremely important diagnosis. And it's something that people, when they understand this, when they start to see this, they realize this is something they need to attend to. They need to be concerned about it. But the best news that I have is that lifestyle changes we now know can help reverse or stave off or keep away for many years the uh, development of type 2 diabetes. And uh, many people with prediabetes can have normal blood sugar. They can treat, if you will, the insulin resistance with lifestyle. In America, we have something called the Diabetes Prevention Program. I know there's been research here as well in Europe that has looked at intervening in these uh, patients. And uh, even though medications can help, in this particular study, the most powerful thing to prevent the development of diabetes in these pre-diabetics was diet and exercise. And especially, it's actually a fairly simple regimen. It's just 30 minutes a day of moderate physical activity and if a person's overweight, losing 5 to 10% of their body weight, 
this decreased their risk of developing diabetes by over 50%. So extremely powerful changes with relatively small lifestyle commitments. So these aren't huge decreases in weight. This is not a huge exercise commitment. Well, I'm not going to go through who you should be concerned about testing, but let's talk about these two other conditions that I mentioned. There's two other things I want you to be aware of are associated with uh, insulin resistance, and it's the polycystic ovary syndrome and it's certain cancers. Do you use that terminology in Europe, polycystic ovary syndrome? Okay. So let's talk about this. Polycystic ovary syndrome, or PCOS, in the United States affects as many as one in every five women. So it's a very common problem. And common symptoms include irregular menstrual periods. They don't come on time at a regular interval. You can have infrequent periods. You can have heavy blood flow. These women also uh, often have increased body hair growth. They tend to be overweight. And one of the most important things is they are often infertile. And I say that's important because this is often something that brings them to medical attention. This is all a result of something that is partly determined by insulin resistance. There's also a list of cancers that are related to abnormal blood sugar, insulin resistance, higher insulin levels, and some of the leading cancers that we deal with in the Western world are on this list, colon, breast, prostate, and you can see some others there as well. So again, you raise insulin levels you, because of increased insulin resistance, and you increase your risk of these uh, cancers. Let's look at a, uh, a study that was actually uh, from uh, Scandinavia looking at this connection between prostate cancer and the metabolic syndrome, also known as Syndrome X. So nearly 2,000 men were recruited for this study. Uh, they followed them for some 13 years. Now, none of them had cancer or diabetes when the study began. But as they followed these individuals, they found if they had the metabolic syndrome, if they had three out of those five questions, positive or more, which was true in 19% of the subjects, they had a 90% increased risk of prostate cancer. So their risk of prostate cancer was essentially doubled by having this particular problem. And this was after adjusting for other things that we know can influence prostate cancer risk. Well, the question is, why was this? Well, here's what the researchers said. First, they said, well, our findings raised the possibility that the treatment or prevention of the metabolic syndrome may be a way to reduce or decrease the risk of prostate cancer, but they suggested there might be a number of things happening that are feeding prostate cancer. It could be the insulin resistance itself, but more likely it's the hyperinsulinemia. Insulin is what we call a trophic hormone. What that means is insulin stimulates growth. And so you don't want to, even if you have patients who have diabetes, if you're a health professional, you don't want to just tell them, hey, don't worry about your diabetes. We can just give you insulin. Now, I, don't, I hope that's not the attitude of any of you in this room. But just giving them more insulin, although it may lower their blood sugar, it creates a host of other problems, including feeding the growth of cancer. There's evidence that higher insulin levels feed the growth of atherosclerosis as well. Doesn't mean you should walk around with a blood sugar of 400. You need to get that blood sugar down because that's even worse. Uh, but in, giving more insulin is not the ideal solution. It's addressing the root cause of the problem, which is impaired glucose functioning, or simply put, insulin resistance. Then metabolic syndrome has other disturbances that uh, go along with it. There's uh, hormones like insulin-like growth factor one, there's sex hormones and sex hormone binding globulins that are affected when the met metabolism is deranged. You don't have to understand all the mechanisms. The point is they've done research like this with prostate cancer. They've done it with breast cancer. And what's happening is when you have increased insulin resistance, you're increasing your risk of certain cancers. So the key message is this is dangerous. It's a dangerous condition. And the question becomes if this is dangerous. If we should be concerned about it, what can I do about it? Well, what we can do is we can address the lifestyle characteristics that impact Syndrome X. And uh, because the good news is insulin resistance is largely reversible. So let's look at the most important slide in this lecture.
This is a summary of everything I've been talking about as well as the things that predispose to insulin resistance. So let's take some time in looking at this slide and then we'll look at some other data that gives us more information. Okay, insulin resistance. Here's what we've been talking about. It increases the risk of cancer, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, low HDL, high triglycerides, blockage in the arteries, and polycystic ovary syndrome. We've talked about that, right? So that's the review portion of the slide. Now here are the, some of the main contributors to insulin resistance. We've mentioned obesity. The more weight you carry, the more insulin resistance you have. So let me ask you a question. Let's say we have someone here today, and it doesn't look like there's anyone here in this room that meets this, but let's say there's someone who weighs 200 kilograms, and they come into this room. Do they have more insulin resistance than optimal? Yes, because of the extra weight, they have more insulin resistance than they need. Our goal should be to try to keep our insulin resistance as low as possible, okay? Now, then we have genetics. Now, we can't change our genetics, but we can turn genes on and off. We've been talking about epigenetics. So although we can't change our genetic background, some of these lifestyle things may be working through either turning certain genes on or s turning other genes off. Sloth or inactivity, lack of activity. So if you're not on a regular exercise program, what can you tell me about your insulin resistance? It's greater than it needs to be. So every one of us should be on a regular exercise program. This would be optimal. Now, if you say, Dr. DeRose, I have severe rheumatoid arthritis. I can hardly walk. Even in the pool, I can do very little. Well, the message is we do the best we can, right? But regular exercise is, uh, is powerful in addressing insulin resistance. What about stress? What do you think stress does? Well, it directly raises insulin resistance and it raises blood sugar levels. What happens when you're under stress is it ramps up what we call the sympathetic nervous system. It hormonally changes things so that blood sugar tends to rise. Now, it's actually useful for your blood sugar to rise if you're in an acute stressful situation. You might need to run some distance. It's good to get more blood sugar into your blood quickly. So the Lord has designed that stress system to help us but we often activate our stress system when we don't need to do something physical, right? You're sitting in your car and you're unhappy with something and uh, you get that stress response. Now, many people are surprised to find poor sleep on here. It's not just poor quality sleep, it's lack of time sleeping. And some of us who may feel like we're doing well in some respects may be doing poorly in this one. And if confession really is good for the soul, I've been doing poorly the last few days with sleep. It didn't help me to be on a plane for some distance. Some of you might be able to sleep on those uh, planes that they cram you into now, but I can't. Uh, so anyway, I was up all night, and you know the story. But there's many, quote, legitimate reasons we can have for not sleeping well. But when we do that, the price we pay is to keep us going. Our body ramps up those stress hormone levels. And that's how you keep going. Now, some people say, well, I've got to take caffeine to keep going. Well, if you're taking caffeine, you're just taking artificial compound to raise your stress hormone levels. That's the main way that caffeine works. It, it blocks uh, a compound called adenosine, and then that, in turn, raises stress hormone levels. So regardless of what the reason is, if you're not getting good sleep, your stress hormone levels will be higher, and your insulin resistance will be worse. So one of the things you want to focus on with your patients and your communities is sleep. And we talked a little bit today about the Sabbath. You heard some mention of that in our panel discussion. I'll give you a study. And in fact, you know, I actually just uh, saw some slides I had made on that study. So maybe I'll give that to you right now. I know it's kind of dangerous to navigate in the middle of a presentation. But uh, if we can find this, you're going to find this fascinating because it actually is a study that relates to some of the things we were talking about this morning. And uh, in particular, this study looks, it looks at Jewish practices and it looks at mortality rates.
and how it relates to the Sabbath. Doesn't that sound like an interesting, uh, an interesting study? So uh, what I'm doing is trying to get to the proper place here so I can give you this, uh, this material. And um, we're going to go to it this way. The study was actually done by a, a series of Israeli researchers. Uh, the, uh, these Israeli researchers were looking at mortality patterns in Israel. And what they were especially looking at is whether there was a difference in mortality rates uh, during certain holidays and during the Sabbath. And so in this particular study that we're going to look at uh, with you, it uh, actually has a very interesting title in the medical research literature. And uh, the title of the paper is right here. It's Death Rests a While. How do you like that for a title? <laughs> Death Rests a While. Holy Day and Sabbath Effects on Jewish Mortality in Israel. So this was done by a husband and wife team, the Ansons, and it was published in a journal that I honestly don't usually read, but I was doing some literature research and came across this paper in the journal Social Science and Medicine, published in 2001, if you're having trouble seeing that reference. It's actually volume 52, pages 83 and onward. And what the Ansons did is they actually uh, looked at, um, before I show you their conclusions, let me tell you what they did. What they did is they graphed mortality for 10 years in Israel. They graphed on a daily basis mortality rates. And they found something fascinating. When you came to the Sabbath, mortality dropped. In other words, less people were dying on the Sabbath, substantially less. Now, some people said, well, the reason for this might be, well, this is one of the potential uh, possibilities, is that in Israel during these years, I believe it was done between uh, 1983 and 1992, when they were doing this study, uh, and I understand it still to this day, the Sabbath is actually a secular holiday or secular day off in Israel. Now, someone told me recently uh, they also have Sunday now as a secular day off as well in Israel. Whether that's true or not, maybe one of you could tell me afterward. They want to just have a Sunday law in Israel. They just put a Sunday law in place in Israel? Okay. I, I heard that they, they want to go in that direction. Okay. I don't know if they are already there. But definitely back in this time, there was one day of rest. So they said, well, it's not just the Jews who are resting from work. It's the Palestinians and the other non-Jews that live in Israel. So they looked at their death rates, and they, no drop. So it was only the Jews that had the drop. And uh, let's look at the comments from the authors. They say the main finding of these analyses was a consistent decline in mortality on the Sabbath, Saturday, for men and women, young and old. This mortality dip was followed by an increase in the number of deaths for men on Sundays and for young women on Mondays. So the rates go back up. No such pattern was observed for children under the age of five. Now that's interesting, isn't it? So it's not just some, it, it seems like it's something that involves our cognition and our, our spiritual nature perhaps, but maybe I'm extrapolating too much. And it didn't help the non-Jewish population, as I pointed out to you. Well, they drew some other conclusions as well. Let's see what else they had to say. Deaths occur on Saturdays, of course, just as they do on every other day of the week. Nonetheless, now this is a, these, these researchers, they didn't strike me as particularly religious researchers, but they're looking at what happens on the Sabbath. And they say, nonetheless, the sacred nature of the Sabbath, it's being set apart from all the mundane work days of the week, creates a special situation in which the probability of death is reduced. We have argued that this special nature derives not from what the Sabbath is not, a work day, but from what it is. Now, they don't mention anything spiritual. They say a day of social gathering and family solidarity. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because many of us sometimes are guilty, at least in transmitting our values of the Sabbath to our children, and teaching them more about what the Sabbath is not than what it is. Do you see? And what these researchers are saying is we see this Sabbath benefit 
And that Sabbath benefit is not because of what you're not doing, it's because of what you are doing. And the reason they're saying this is, remember, all the non-Jews were not doing their regular work on that day as well. So it's just something unique about what the Sabbath is in the Jewish, or we would say the biblical culture that gives it this uh, power to decrease mortality. So really just a fascinating uh, study. And uh, here's a little bit more from these authors. Holy days ascribe meaning to the passage of time and on the other rites, festivals, and ceremonies uh, enhance social integration, support, and a sense of belonging. And I think consequently participation in collective action which characterizes religious holy days, augments internal coping resources, and leads to a postponement in mortality, particularly that deriving from degenerative internal causes. So they're postulating now what's happening, but they're basically saying, we see the Sabbath benefit, and here we think this is biologically plausible. There's reasons why we would expect the Sabbath to have these benefits. Okay, the question is now uh, inquiring as to how much I really know, know about uh, Judaic health practices. And uh, my knowledge of, uh, of practices in Israel is somewhat limited. So I can't, uh, I can't comment on anything else uh, today other than what I just showed you from that single reference. I really don't have much uh, knowledge about the current uh, lifestyle practices in Israel. But I know there's a few in our midst who are uh, living in Israel, and maybe you could track them down and inquire. Is anyone here in the room uh, right now living in Israel or have some experience? You'd become our, our local expert. Okay, so in the last four minutes, let me just give you a little bit more information about the, uh, the slide that I was showing you, that one key slide uh, as far as uh, insulin resistance. So we're going to come back to that. And let's look at um, a few other things. Now, aging, medications, medical conditions, yes, they're on the list. Uh, tobacco is a huge contributor to insulin resistance, but let's just uh, illustrate a few of these things. And in our next segment, we're going to come back, expand the dialogue a bit to, to look more specifically at lifestyle and diabetes. Uh, it's interrelated to this, but we're going to conclude with a few of these uh, things that impact Syndrome X and a little bit more data for you. Um, when it comes to diet, the factors in the diet that seem to be the worst as far as increasing insulin resistance are the trans fats, so the partially hydrogenated uh, vegetable oils, and then also you can see on that list the uh, possibly excess of plant fats, omega-3 fats may decrease the risk. But the big problem are those uh, animal fats and the partially hydrogenated vegetable oils, the trans fats. This uh, actually gives you some research that uh, was done in uh, Europe looking at this. Uh, these are uh, researchers, I believe, from the Netherlands who've uh, done this work. And they were actually, it's actually showing you a fairly complicated slide, but what it's illustrating is the worst fats if you compare changes in HDL cholesterol and LDL cholesterol both, you'll find that the very worst fats are the saturated fats and the trans fats they both tend to raise dramatically the LDL, and uh, the worst one is the uh, trans fats. It actually, if anything, can lower HDL. At the same time, it's raising the bad cholesterol. Things that can help you as far as metabolic syndrome, eating more whole grains, eating more fiber, eating more magnesium. We'll come back to these topics in the next hour and uh, we'll talk more about magnesium. I want to end with exercise. Exercise extremely powerful. Uh, cardiovascular fitness, if you're p unfit, you have triple to six times the risk of developing these kind of conditions that are related to the metabolic syndrome. So if this was not a call for us to take a break very soon, I don't know what is. So I, at this point, I'd like to encourage you with that uh, final graphic uh, that we have. And that's just reminding you that this is a pervasive problem. Insulin resistance, it lays at the root of heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, even some cancers and infertility. And if you address this with lifestyle, you can make a huge difference. Let's close with a word of prayer together.
Father in heaven, even though we haven't looked at all of these lifestyle components in detail, you're reminding us that you've got a comprehensive lifestyle program that we should have confidence to unashamedly share with the world. Help to better equip us to do that as we continue to go through this seminar. Help us to take things away from this particular segment that will make us more of a blessing in our churches and in our communities, in our own homes. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.